Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Campus Consortium's Ed Talks webinar series. Today's topic for the Ed Talk is Return to Campus and Prep for the New Normal, Student Experience and Engagement in the COVID Classroom. Our presenters for today's session are Dr. Miari Andrea, Executive Director, Center for Innovation at Western University of Health Sciences. Lisa Stephens, Assistant Dean, Digital Education at UB School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Rebecca Frazee, Faculty Learning Design and Technology at San Diego State University and Associate Director at FlexSpace. And we have Dr. Carl Horvath, Chief Information Officer at LaSalle University. We will take questions at the end of today's presentation. Please enter the questions into the chat box or questions pane in your Zoom control panel. Now, without further ado, please allow me to present Miari, Lisa, Rebecca, and Carl. Over to you, Carl. Thank you very much, Rosie, much appreciated. And uh, welcome to uh, our panelists for today's Ed Talk. And welcome to all of you out there. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, we had almost 400 uh, attendees register for this Ed Talk. Uh, so uh, this is uh, likely a popular topic for all of us in all our schools. Uh, and we'll talk today a little bit about uh, from the teaching and learning perspective of what we're doing to prepare for that, how we have to make some changes. And uh, I think there'll be some great ideas that we can explore. Um, out of those uh, uh, 400 attendees or registrants, I definitely have seen a few people that are my neighbors. Uh, we have down the street Dawn from Temple University. Uh, we also have uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh, Abraham and Alan from Pepperdine University. Looks like Andrew from Ithaca College is here and Lorraine from uh, John Hopkins and uh, Janae from Penn State. So uh, we have uh, quite a diverse uh, uh, crowd in terms of the type of institutions that are attending because these issues are affecting all of our schools now. Um, so I'd like to just, you know, uh, start off quickly with a little poll because this will be an interactive uh, uh, presentation. We really like audience participation, uh, so we would like to get some information from you uh, as we move along and, and present each presenter. Uh, we'll also bring in your thoughts and your experiences. So we have a few poll questions that we'll insert uh, as we move through. Uh, this first poll question, um, has the pandemic's required use of technology permanently affected the expectations of students and the type of flexibility for schedules and engagement that they may expect in the future. That's mostly somewhat or not at all. Um, so if you could uh, answer the question on the poll on your screen, uh, we'll uh, take a look at that and briefly talk about that uh, once we get the results reported back. Um, yeah, so let me just tell you a little bit about uh, what Campus Consortium is. Uh, I came to know Campus Consortium some years ago as a collaborative community. Um, you know, it's a, as I had said, it's very diverse because it has so many different types of institution, large and small. Um, and, and the, the uh, institutions um, collaborate well, and we usually can get ideas from each other. The Campus Consortium itself um, it kind of uh, brings everyone around the same table and solves for large problems that really affect us all. And then uh, also uh, some unique and customized incidences uh, where uh, it, you know, we, we have special cases. Uh, we can talk to others who may have had the same issue and share uh, those uh, solutions with each other. Uh, but Campus Consortium is a leading nonprofit educational association. Um, and uh, it, it started about uh, 17 years ago in 2003. It's got a membership of thousands of higher education K through 12 school district members. And um, it was founded by the current chairman, which is Anjali Jain, who worked with 14 founding higher education institutions, including Case Western Reserve University, Rochester Institute of Technology, and University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Compass Consortium established 
an executive advisory committee of higher ed leaders and CIOs to guide its mission, and this structure is still in place today. What I like about the consortium is that it's guided and influenced by a community of my peers. Campus Consortium reacts to the needs of the education community and assists where it needs the help most. Membership includes both large and small institutions that are involved and they want to help each other. And I've been able to implement projects at my institutions that would never have been possible without this association. I've also benefited from the collaboration and relationships of its members. There's no need to reinvent the wheel when you can leverage a community of peers who have addressed similar projects and problems. The Campus Consortium mission is to serve the underserved by providing grants and underwriting to uh, projects that can benefit students and align with institutional uh, strategic plans for all members. This slide show uh, that you'll, you'll see um, basically uh, highlights uh, here a couple of recent grants, uh, University of Redlands and Calumet College, uh, uh, grants that uh, provide you know, these uh, grants to help provide solutions that they may not normally have been able to afford. Um, also, you know, although there are primarily higher education institutions in attendance today, and I called out a few folks, uh, we also have some vendors in, us, in, in attendance and vendors that I know the consortium has worked with in the past, and that would be Dell. Uh, computers here, and Oracle, another vendor called Unit 4, um, and, uh, you know, welcome to all. Uh, it, without our vendors, without our licensing, without our implementation, and without our, our support uh, uh, from our vendors and our partners, uh, we would not be able to do what we can do. And so it's everybody working together and contributing to provide solutions for higher education. So Campus Consortium is really focused on that uh, mission to uh, provide the best and most effective uh, student engagement and enable uh, teaching, learning, uh, the workflow of uh, schools, colleges, universities, education in general, uh, and make it as easy as possible with the most effective solutions. Campus Consortium provides that overall guidance to, to um, help institutions succeed. So um, we just had a poll, and I'm sorry, I think I missed the results on that poll, but uh, we will get that and bring that back up a little bit later. Here's another one to start off before we uh, introduce our first speaker. When classes start this fall, will your campus be prepared uh, to offer high quality uh, and engaging online instructions if or as needed? Mostly, somewhat, or not at all? So, you know, we're all facing, uh, of course, the pandemic and the uh, you know, reaction, our res COVID response. Um, all, all of us have been in meetings and, you know, many of us are still making decisions about what is the most effective uh, approach to, uh, you know, the, the start of the fall semester and uh, looking ahead to the spring. It's also about making investments. Uh, if we make investments now, will we need them a year from now? So we have to be very prudent about the solutions that we come up with. But it's also about uh, online, you know, that we will be, all of us, uh, working online at, at, at some point and continuing to do that into the future. So here's uh, the poll results. When classes start in the fall, will your campus be prepared to offer high quality and engaging online instruction if and as needed? And it looks like 75% of uh, the respondents said yes, uh, um, somewhat 52% and not at all. We have some folks that are, that are there too. So the great thing about the community here is that we can help each other with advice, even support and assistance sometimes. So uh, for those that are more underprepared than prepared for a semester that may just start in a few weeks, uh, you're at the right place and with the right community that can provide assistance. So it's all about staying co connecting and staying in contact with each other and being a member of the consortium, you're able to do that. So uh, let's get on to our first uh, presenter. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Miari Andrea. Uh, Miari has worked in higher education for more than 20 years with a focus on leveraging technology to enhance teaching and learning. His passion lies in creating strategies and solutions designed to create engaging learning experiences by embracing innovative pedagogical models. 
He led innovation initiatives by architecting 3D learning components using AR and VR, and by leading the creation of gamified learning solutions incorporated within the academic curriculum. Uh, among the technology solutions integrated with the learning experience that Miati has been involved in, including the implementation of the Internet of Things related technologies, digital sensors, eye beacons, and artificial intelligence. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Andrea, and uh, I think you'll find his presentation very interesting. Please take it away, Miati. Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, it is indeed a a pleasure to be here and uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Miari and I work at uh, Western University of Health Sciences for the Center for Innovation. Uh, the, uh, our university is a graduate medical school located in Southern California. My presentation will discuss uh, essentially three main areas. Um, the first one is the inst institutional challenges related to the return on campus, followed by a discussion related to the digital learning modality quadrant and a description of some of the technologies that uh, we use to address the curriculum delivery needs. So let's start with the challenges. The first one, which uh, I think is uh, quasi universal, is the faculty teaching readiness. And uh, among these is the fact that transitioning from an on premise and a lecture based uh, uh, platform to uh, de develop pretty much like on the spot online proficiency is quite a challenge. So that is our first challenge. And um, that transition is going to be a major obstacle and if not a major challenge for, for us. Um, the reason why you, know, you have institutions such as the Online Learning Consortium uh, who are dedicated to advancing quality digital teaching and learning experiences designed to reach and engage the modern learner. Uh, they are specialized in, in that type of training to get people to, uh, instructors and faculty members, to gain the, uh, the um, proficiency to teach online. And the same is true for Quality Matters. The other um, uh, challenge that we have is uh, related to faculty is the, to have the adequate remote technology and support needed to do remote teaching. And that could be something as minor or as, as mundane as the microphone needs and video cameras, as well as laptops, um, and uh, as well as tech support for troubleshooting technology challenges. Uh, the other aspect of this challenge is related to the uh, quote unquote home classroom concept. In other words, teaching from, from home uh, in, in other words, you have to transform your habitat into a learning and teaching space. And that comes with several challenges, including environmental factors, disturbances. Um, you know, sometimes I've, I've heard uh, uh, t faculty members teaching with a dog barking in the background, uh, light conditions, and kids and noise and, and whatnot. Um, the other set of uh, challenges are technological challenges, and that's just like re having reliable Ethernet, adequate bandwidth, and computing resources. Um, the other set of challenge uh, is related to, curric to the curriculum adaptation. Uh, slicing and dicing the curriculum to fit learning modules within modified timeframes uh, that is a, quite a challenge. Uh, the ability to adapt the curriculum to fit the, uh, you know, we'll discuss this later on, but it's called the permutated and, and the alternated learning modalities. Those are all major challenges. And in some cases we had to, the, the, the didactic portion of our curriculum uh, had to be mod modified. And these are just to name uh, just a few. The other uh, set of challenge is related to technology readiness. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, to, make, to ensure that the, the ethernet uh, is reliable, the bandwidth is adequate, the computing cap capabilities are there, as well as the use of software technologies used for remote teaching. Uh, the next uh, set of challenge relates to the fact that we have nine colleges using essentially nine modalities. And that entails 
a multiplication of logistical assist required to support the learning endeavor across all colleges. That also entails a multiplication of variables adversely affecting the learning experience across all colleges. Our university will be pretty much, will be using pretty much all, all of the uh, modalities that we will discuss in the next section with the addition of other modalities specific to medical education because we are a graduate medical school. Uh, the other set of challenges uh, is uh, linked to learning spaces. Uh, we have uh, capacity constraints due, due to social uh, distancing. We also have increased sanitizing regimens that need to be performed to ensure the health and safety of our students, faculty, and support staff. Um, also, as far as lab sessions are concerned, the challenges stem from replicating, adapting, and substituting lab sessions which are for the most part hands-on, on-premise sessions. The other uh, critical concern that we have is linked to student experience. Um, we have this uh, fear that the online learning experience will be a subpar uh, learning experience. So actually one of, the, uh, one of the strategies that we've adopted is to uh, give students the ability to assess every single class session through the LMS. And then we would have the measurements mm -hmm. and the KPIs required to assess the student learning experience. Uh, now related to that is the quality of uh, teaching and learning uh, challenge. And, and again, this is a major concern. Uh, speaking to faculty members, uh, they have um, the concern that the Number one, it's hard to really gauge and measure the quality of teaching and learning. The secondly, um, we have the, the, the issue of making sure that the teachers have the adequate training to, to actually teach online. So now let's transition to a discussion related to the various learning modalities through the analysis of the digital learning modality quadrant, which is on the next uh, slide. So uh, this uh, graphic that you see is called the uh, digital learning modality quadrant. And the four quadrants are essentially the face-to-face -face asynchronous. The second one is the face-to-face -face synchronous. The third one is synchronous virtual, and the fourth, fourth one is asynchronous virtual. So let's go and kind of elaborate on each one of these uh, uh, quadrants. The first one, which is the face-to-face -face asynchronous, does not necessarily, does not necessitate the use of technology as far as the delivery of the curriculum is concerned. So the hybrid essentially is a combination of on and off premise learning, uh, the class, class sessions are held in on-premise, or students also learn off-premise. The permutated modality essentially means that students are cycled through sequences of learning sessions. The permutations may involve the use of multiple rooms or locations. The alternated modality um, implies that students come to campus in groups or waves and would alternate in attending a session repeated throughout the day. I know of uh, actually of an, one institution using the alternated modality that has scheduled alternated sessions from morning until 10 p.m. Now, the async high flex, which stands for high flexibility, this refers to a modality that essentially gives students the ability or the flexibility to attend or not on-premise lectures. Courses in, in this modality are delivered in a classroom setting for on-premise students with the option of being digitally recorded for non-attending students. The second quadrant is the face-to-face -face synchronous uh, modality. And essentially this is your, uh, next uh, slide. So the face-to-face uh, -face synchronous is essentially your traditional lecture setting. Uh, this is what we've done for decades now. Um, and this modality can also be used to facilitate group learning. Sync 
HyFlex describes essentially a modality where the same professor lectures simultaneously in a live session to a remote audience and an in-classroom on-premise audience. Students are given the flexibility to choose to attend a live lecture or log in and attend remotely. I would like to um, add a little note here that uh, at Western U, we've been actually using sync high flex modality for more than 10 years. And we've been able to determine that the level of competency is not correlated with on-premise attendance. Uh, that is a quite an quite a, um, a, uh, interesting observation. So this modality can accommodate lab sessions through the use of technology classroom equipped with streaming capabilities. Now the uh, third quadrant, which is the um, uh, virtual synchronous on the next slide, is essentially uh, related to class sessions that are live and scheduled with no on-premise alternative. The, uh, the third quadrant involved the fact that faculty members stream live lectures from home or from on campus, their own campus office, or from green screen classrooms, which we will discuss at a later time. The fourth uh, and last uh, quadrant is uh, designated as the virtual asynchronous uh, modality. This modality refers to a self-directed and self-guided learning experience. It relies solely on technology and digital platforms for the delivery of the curriculum, and it can make use of uh, pre-recorded lectures. It is actually an agile implementation of virtual asynchronous learning through the uh, adoption of adaptive learning, which we will discuss in a at a, at a later stage. And actually this allows us to segue into the exploration of some of the technologies that we use to support the various modalities that we just discussed. So these technologies are related to uh, video capture, virtual learning components, assistive um, uh, green screen technologies, and uh, uh, adaptive learning. So let's move on to the next slide to discuss the uh, video lecture capture. So our, st our institution is among the very first institution to embrace an enterprise video cap lecture capture solutions more than like 15 years ago. However, given the current crisis, we've, um, we've tried to uh, leverage more of the features built in into those the video lecture capture system. For instance, we were able to identify that we could actually engage into virtual discussions through our video lecture capture system. Uh, we are able to uh, include uh, or incorporate annotated video moments, as well as build digital library with search and playlist features. And most importantly, from an engagement uh, standpoint, uh, we are able to actually have and provide interactivity between faculty and students, as we will see in the next slide. But also it gives us the, uh, so let's move on to the next slide to, uh, to look into the video lecture capture. So I won't go through the, all the, the pieces, the moving pieces related to video lecture uh, technology, but I just would like to focus on the engage piece. So this is the, the uh, technology that allows teachers and students to interact and build these um, social moments, as well as these discussions and exchanges through the video platform. And um, the, one of the critical aspects of using this platform is the ability to harvest intuitive analytics and real-time insights, as well as success metrics. So let's move on into the next um, um, technology, which is uh, again really uh, related to virtual learning components. So these are essentially, it's a combination of um, off the shelf as well as custom built learning components. And uh, all, most of them are gamified learning uh, components. Uh, they are highly interactive. They have uh, built-in assessment, uh, they have built-in assessments, and it can be used in a synchronous or asynchronous manner, 
and um, they have um, they are mobile friendly. And on the next slide, uh, I want to show you one of those custom built uh, learning components that we created. And this is for our school of uh, optometry, where uh, the, the instructors are actually using this tool both synchronously and asynchronously by um, on one side giving assignments to the students related to the online platform and then getting together to discuss the, learn, the lesson, lesson learn, learned and other um, aspects of the curriculum related to this course. Actually, we've, um, we've embedded a complete one semester course in an online custom build uh, platform such as this one in order to um, uh, conduct synchronous and asynchronous uh, teaching experiences, teaching and learning experiences for our students. So uh, moving on to the uh, next uh, uh, section. So the green screen classroom, this is a, actually a, quite an interesting concept because we've, uh, what we've done is we've actually repurposed some of our, our traditional classrooms and transformed them into green screen uh, space, uh, learning and meeting spaces. And really the um, design ethos of these green screen spaces is to create rich, engaging, and enhance learning experiences. So let's move on to the next screen to show have a visual of how some of these spaces look like. So on your um, uh, left side, you see a repurposed uh, meeting room that we've, uh, uh, we've added uh, flexible technology in there. You see the, the screens on the remote screens on, on, on both sides where you can view the remote, view, remote attendees. And the main, the main piece of this uh, room is obviously the, the green screen at the back, in the background that allows us to essentially superimpose the instructor and any other learning components or learning materials, whether it's a, a 2D uh, graphic or 3D graphic or video graphic playing simultaneously in the background, which is why I mentioned the fact that uh, this, this design truly creates a rich and engaging and enhance, enhance learning experiences. The um, last piece of technology that I want to share with you is the um, adaptive learning uh, systems, which has allowed, which has given us the ability to really function more, um, I would say, more efficiently in the in a moment of crisis such as this one. So we are currently using two adaptive learning platforms that are actually artificial intelligence driven. So um, th at the heart of every uh, adaptive learning system is uh, essentially a. Um, a, a, an engine, an adaptive learning platform that has an engine that provides digital interaction, built-in assessments, adaptive learning experience, and, a, and most importantly, a personalized learning path for every single student. And the next slide will show us kind of uh, as a general understanding of um, how the, uh, the uh, adaptive learning system work, works. And, uh, it is using uh, essentially a prediction model uh, and it is driven by the adaptive engine. So the platform then analyzes the learner's strengths, weaknesses, learning and engagement patterns uh, and creates an updated and personal, personalized learning path for the students. And that concludes my uh, presentation. Back to you, Carl. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, sounds like you are prepared, uh, which uh, the, the, these uh, projects are, are just amazing. Um, we, have a, we have another quick poll. Which scenario do you foresee as your primary option this fall? Primary on campus, face-to-face, -face, some online, or primary online, some face-to-face -face when necessary? Primary hybrid or high flex classes or campus closed, all instruction online. So if you could uh, answer this one, be interesting to see uh, what m most people plan and what others uh, are thinking about doing. Um, so uh, Miani, th this is uh, a re really good work. 
I can see that uh, across uh, all, all these uh, programs uh, that you're using multiple uh, modalities uh, in order to uh, really connect with students. And so uh, you're using technology on ground, but you're also uh, you know, making many things much more available online, correct? That is correct, uh, Carl. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's definitely, uh, I, I see you have quite an investment in technology there, and that uh, will pay off into the future, as I think that uh, this COVID situation has really just forced us into uh, accelerating what we wanted to do anyway, which was provide more technology and more online uh, into the future. Um, I'd like to uh, just kind of give you the results of this uh, last poll real quick. Which scenario do you foresee as your primary option this fall? Interesting. Uh, primarily on campus, face-to-face, -face, about 19% uh, with some online. Uh, the, the largest uh, response here uh, looks like 45% is primarily online, some face-to-face -face when necessary. Uh, and then 28% primarily hybrid or high flex classes. And then uh, about 8% of the audience campus closed all instruction online. So a lot of people are still pivoting. They're still making decisions about which direction they want to go. But, you know, what's really been affected is, you know, what higher education is all about. And that is the teaching and learning. And that's what we're talking about today. So uh, really good presentation and let me introduce our next speaker, uh, which is Dr. Lisa Stevens. Uh, Dr. Lisa Stevens serves as an assistant dean, University at Buffalo School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, leading the Office of Digital and Online Education and also has an appointment as senior strategist for academic innovation in the office of the SUNY Provost. She holds an adjunct associate professorship at the University of Buffalo Department of Communication. Lisa's portfolio includes development of online and global education content for the UB School of Engineering and program director of Flexspace.org, the Flexible Learning Environments Exchange, an open global repository and community of practices of focused on teaching in innovative campus learning environments. Lisa's research is focused on administrative choice of technology adoption. She regularly presents at conferences and events on topics of educational innovation and contributes to publications. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Stevens. Thank you so much, Carl. Yes, I wear multiple hats. It keeps me very engaged and very busy. Thanks, Miari. There, there really is some fascinating research going on in COGSI, uh, particularly around measuring the effectiveness and the impact of um, learning technologies. And I'm anxious to see more of that as it's rolling out. It was fun to see a, a little taste of that. And of course, thank you, Carl, and the entire behind the scenes campus consortium crew that are making today's event possible. I really want to speak primarily today about some work I've done out of SUNY in that um, senior strategist role and looking at some of the innovations that have a broad impact. And one of the underlying questions behind that was our collective confusion around terminology. I'm always trying to be sensitive to the terminology that we all use when seeking precision is often a barrier to those outside of our discipline. And uh, I have worked in a number of different backgrounds. I've worked in the AVIT field and in broadcasting before I entered the academy. And it's, it's easy for me to slip back into technical jargon and broadcast speak. And it's all equally frustrating to my friends in the AVIT community when I start talking about various learning theories or you know, start going into instructional design speak. So let's, let's start by level setting. And I think, I think we already have for the most part. Um, 
there's a need for sensitivity around what is remote teaching and learning, which is primarily emergency. I mean, what's, it's what we all got you know, confronted with in the COVID crisis. Whereas for many, many years, online learning, distance learning has been fully planned. It's been resourced. It's supported, obviously, in, in, you know, in, in an ideal scenario. And it's well thought through in terms of its design to maximize the effectiveness of that learning engagement and learning impact in an online world. It's really not meant to be the same experience as sitting in a classroom. And many faculty have found that it can be more effective than sitting in a classroom, but only when really thought through strategically. So the challenge I think we were all hit with is how are we going to very rapidly <laughs> reconfigure all those spaces that we have on campus? How are we going to maintain academic continuity with all of our learners, whether they were planning on attending in our classrooms or perhaps attending in some hybrid fashion or now suddenly find themselves all in a remote learning situation. And I had to put the quote in because a friend of mine said, man, I thought Y2K was hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. Um, so a little deeper dive, what kind of environments are needed and how are we going to benchmark those examples? Where do we find information that's specific to implementing the necessary technologies uh, making sure that we're aligned with our faculty needs because let's face it, faculty have different teaching styles just as students have different learning styles. And, you know, the benchmarking, again, it's the, it's the technical potpourri of terms. Uh, all of my AVIT CIO friends like to speak almost in terms of branding. And that just, you know, goes right over the head of most of my faculty friends. They don't, they don't speak brands, they speak process. So, uh, it, wearing my assistant dean hat, we've had to think creatively about how are we going to manage, particularly at a research university, uh, or as Miari Express, we're also a medical campus. How are you going to enable students access to that specialized equipment, to the instrumentation, particularly those that are engaged in research that's leading to their dissertation and their, their doctorates, and they're contributing uh, to, to the academy. Um, hybrid learning, to boil it right down, is the, the faculty member still has the say about how the cohort is going to engage with the learning. High from the perspective of the stakeholders who are engaged in the pedagogy, the space, and the technology. And let's go to the next slide. In order to get to FlexSpace, which is a very large repository. Uh, you know, this is a very all-encompassing uh, kind of a philosophical approach to teaching. It's not just another, say, modality per, per se, correct? FlexSpace is, if I'm following your, your pinch hit uh, while I was being distracted, FlexSpace is a large, large database where we can work across those various uh, jargon-induced stakeholder groups mm. and get to best exemplars of learning space environments. And I have a few screenshots of how we've got some contemporary solutions that are focused on uh, focused on COVID-19 response. But if you're interested in going to this, this large open repository, you really just need to go to flexspace.org and uh, sign up for an account. There's lots of resources there. Let's go to the next page. And this all began when our SUNY level provost said, you know, wait, <laughs> we're spending way too much money. How can we talk amongst ourselves? And it's very much in the values that you espoused earlier, Carl, around the campus consortium. Uh, long story short, we were moving along on a back end of a portal. We were helping Art Store test their shared shelf product and then came to uh, a place where they, um, where they had been bought by another company and said, you guys need to go find a no new home to live. Rebecca said, it's time to go big or go home. And here we are, we went big, we have a custom portal. You can see that we have over 5,000 people making use of the portal now from 67 different countries. We love how international it is now. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the essence of all of this is you can go in and filter on a variety of learning spaces through uh, all sorts of different criteria. We also have curated galleries that are labeled and you can search. Uh, you can see the third gallery down is specific to medical education and we have some galleries on high flex courses or high flex uh, environments. Next slide. And for each record that's uploaded, uh, there are details uh, provided through a template. In this particular case at Wake Forest, Brent put up a lot of detail around what the idea was behind the space, all of the photos that were involved. Next uh, slide, please. And then the key to saving time and energy and effort here is there are pre-described um, room attributes that you can click off when you're uploading a space that makes it very easy to browse with the tabs and you can put in search terms to find exactly the kind of space that you're looking to benchmark with and then of course it's nice to be able to upload the story and the, the impact that it's had on the users next slide now important to reinforce that uh, rebecca and i do not uh, run this. This is all peer contributed content. We will manage some of the, the galleries, but it's all peer contributed spaces. And the way we've stayed in touch with the current COVID crisis is to keep in touch with what's going on in the listservs and start to gather that information and we've put it into specific toolkits. The other way that people can share within the portal is through idea boards where you can actually tag any peer that's in any one of those 5,000 people that are in the portal. You can invite them to collaborate on a particular space inside an internal idea board. Next slide, please. Here's two examples in particular. I might add that some people have asked, why didn't we make this portal completely open to the world? And the answer is simple. I don't necessarily want everyone in the public to see all of my spaces. I'm more than happy to share within this community, but I don't want people that don't necessarily understand all the challenges to have access to the content. So the community decided together that we would have that, that uh, credentialing involved, that you have to have an account to get into all the rich content in, behind the, the login. So we have two examples up right now uh, that are in the toolkits and the idea boards. One is what ASU is doing with their SYNC program where they're making education even more available. And uh, San Diego, I know that Rebecca is gonna talk about that shortly. Next slide. We also have a nice resource collection where Rebecca has been curating a lot of the content that's on the listservs. If you go to the faculty guides for active learning, it will take you right into a Google Doc where you can get even more information. In some ways, it's information overload, but we've tried to design it very, very uh, to, to be user friendly. Let's go to the next slide. I think that might be it. And again, sorry for the distraction. <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, real quick, another, uh, our last poll. Uh, are faculty and staff prepared with technology required to successfully engage students on ground and online? Mostly, somewhat, or not at all? Uh, if you could uh, please respond to the poll and uh, we'll, we'll look at the results in just a second. Uh, but Lisa, it looks like in, in your institution, uh, there's, uh, the, there's not just resources on ground, but these online resources that uh, really help faculty uh, create a strategy for what they want to do. So it's really a sharing of ideas, correct? Correct. And it's very handy during accreditation time when you need to go in and benchmark with your peers. And you can filter through uh, public universities, private universities, community colleges, it's open to all educators, free to education and uh, K through 12. I see that, that our friend Chris Johnson is in. We have a nice alliance with ISTE as well. That's great. Um, all right, so uh, here's the results of the poll. 
Uh, our faculty and staff prepare with technology required to successfully engage students on ground and online, uh, mostly about 37 uh, percent. And of course, most everybody looks like we're right in the middle, about 58 percent of somewhat. And we do have some that are not at all ready. And uh, well, let's uh, start talking. How can we help communicate, uh, share ideas like Lisa uh, just was uh, sharing with, with FlexSpace uh, and other, other technology needs. Uh, Campus Consortium is a good place to come for advice and assistance. Um, I'd like to introduce our uh, next and last speaker, uh, Dr. Rebecca Frazee. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Frizzee is a faculty member in the Learning Design and Technology Program at San Diego State University in the School of Journalism and Media Studies, where she teaches educational technology, learning environment design, program evaluation, and digital and social media analytics. Rebecca is also the Director of Operations and Community Manager of Flexspace.org, the flexible learning environment that we just heard about from Lisa. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to, uh, without further ado, also introduce uh, Dr. Frizzee, and uh, please tell us what you're doing in preparation for COVID. Sure. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. Glad to be here, everybody. Uh, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide as well. Uh, what, uh, and I know this was the question on the poll earlier, so that was really interesting to me is, you know, this mix of what is our campus going to look like this fall? So uh, I wanted to talk about what we're doing at San Diego State and uh, and then go from this sort of macro level of how we're planning and preparing across the campus and then go down into more of a micro level and talk about, you know, wearing my instructional design hat and faculty support hat. Uh, you know, what are we, what can we do at the micro level to design engaging uh, learning experiences? And somebody earlier, Michelle asked in the chat, well, how do we all define what we mean by ex a learning experience? So I'll talk about that here. So I, I I loved putting this together with these different pictures. What is it going to look like? Wearing masks, social distancing, video, you know, Zoom calls and so forth, self-paced learning. You know, we've heard many examples from Miati and Lisa and we're all, I feel like I'm nodding my head like, you know, yes, this is what's happening as well. So I'm at San Diego State as, as Carl said, uh, and obviously we're in San Diego, Southern California. And you can go to the next slide here. So this slide deck will be available and I've included several URLs to share with you. This is all publicly available, what we're doing at San Diego State. So we have about 33,000 students, I think, at San Diego State. We have uh, the, the CSU, California State University system, made a bold and early decision to call it, you know, and say we're going on fully online. Then there were decisions being made on, okay, well, if there are courses that require face face to face on campus, whether it's special equipment, you know, labs, art studios, and so forth, what's going to need to be on campus. So um, we have, you can see here, we are planning on about 200 courses to be on campus, but everything else is online. So we're calling this, you know, SDSU Flex, and uh, we are embracing this high flex model um, for those on campus classes and then everything else is really more of an online learning experience. And so we are, uh, you can see a lot of the, the, the initiatives that are going on on our campus. So we're outfitting and modifying these existing, some of the existing classrooms with even more um, video capabilities, Zoom room capabilities and so forth and calling these the connected classrooms. And then, some of the planning process has involved uh, tiger teams. And if you haven't heard that term, it's sort of this pop-up team that's specifically laser focused on one aspect. And so these tiger teams we've been putting together, um, you know, from the, the president and the provost calling together uh, these teams made up of administrators, faculty, even students. Um, and so these are, this is just a few of them. So there's a tiger team all about high flex. What's that going to look like? How do we do assessment online? What are the policies? What are the expectations? What are the tools and techniques? Um, you know, how do we approach labs online and so forth? But even also 
as importantly, um, co-curricular student life. What is that going to look like in an online world um, and so forth? So you can see some of those initiatives there. Uh, and so just to give you some more context of where we are, we had already been using Blackboard and then we were in a Canvas pilot for the LMS. And when um, March hit, we were still in the, um, the pilot. And so we also made the call to sort of compress that timeline and say, yes, we are going to embrace Canvas. We still support Blackboard. And so uh, there's been a lot of faculty support this summer that I'll get into right um, shortly. But you can see also we're, we've rolled out this. So, so all of these changes are going on uh, amidst other chain, big changes, you know, rolling out Google Suite, Adobe Creative Suite, and so forth. And we have a, a facilities um, a huge initiative that is we just were uh, able to take over this what's called San Diego State West. It's in Mission Valley here in San Diego, if you know the San Diego area. And so they're still planning having to go on with what's going on next in this actual physical environment while we're all, um, you know, operating online. You can go to the next slide. So this is just a teaser. I don't need to talk to this slide. But again, if you go to sdsu.edu slash flex, you will see more of what we're doing to prepare for this flexible online um, engagement for the fall. So again, this is just a list of these different Tiger teams. You can see all of the different um, planning that's going on and you can just visit that, that URL and you can go to the next slide. So for instance, again, there are URLs on this slide for you to visit. You can go to our course um, registration or course schedule for the fall, and you can see here's one of the courses that will be on campus. I said there's 7% or about 200 courses. So on the right here, you can see there's a page. It's publicly available. It lists all of our courses that will be on campus this fall, and you can see it's organized by different colleges. And so I just wanted to point out in this screenshot, here are some of the footnotes in the course registration or course schedule that when students are looking at this course there are these different footnotes that say things like face mask must be worn while in the face-to-face -face class there's going to be a staggered face-to-face -face and virtual attendance pattern and that's something that Miyati um, mentioned at Western University as well the staggered um, you know attendance pattern you can see that required course materials webcam and microphone so that's going to assume hey we're we're planning to be together on campus, but you also need to be able to engage online. And maybe if campus ends up shutting down again, it will we'll have to have our, you know, all of our engagement online. So you can see how we're um, another way we're approaching that. You can go to the next slide. So I've also been involved um, for the first time really in faculty development at San Diego State this summer. So I teach in the learning design and technology program. I teach undergrads and master students in instructional design. But this summer, you know, uh, I we instructional designers and ed techers almost became first responders, right? I never thought that would happen, but um, it's all hands on deck. So I've been helping with this um, very significant faculty development experience this summer where it's, it's, uh, it was based on an uh, existing faculty development program that we had at San Diego State called the Course Design Institute. So this is now Faculty Course Design Summer Institute put now one about a thousand faculty have gone through this and it's an online experience with a human uh, touch component so that there are small groups of faculty who are working with one peer mentor so I've been serving as a peer mentor and there are different modules of self-paced learning where they're getting it goes to um, learning theories and uh, educational technology tool help them increase engagement and so forth in addition to the new learning management system that they're learning as well um, you can see one of the screenshots of one of our peer mentor meetings here and then we're also giving them a digital badge so that they've they've completed this um, this summer Institute and so you can see some of the other ways that we're supporting faculty so after going through this Institute we also continue to have um, 
tech, technology checkout for, for faculty who need the technology at home. We will then turn this summer institute into a self-paced resource so that faculty can continue to go use it as a reference. Someone who didn't go through the institute this summer can use it as a reference and so forth. We also have what we call the virtual fit center. So it was fa faculty instructional technology support center. It's now called the fit center, the uh, VFIT. And um, click of a button, they can get into a Zoom call with just-in-time support from our instructional technology services staff. And then if they have a specific question, they can be moved into a breakout room and talk one-on-one -on -one with somebody who can help them with their needs um, and so forth. So that's a resource as well. And then you can see students, we need to get them up to speed on how to be a successful learner. We already had those kinds of resources going on. And then, like I said, that Tiger team that's looking at that co-curricular student experience. And you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So one of the things that um, that we are promoting in this faculty uh, course design institute is this idea of promoting uh, presence. And you can see this is based on the community of inquiry theory uh, um, and uh, all about presence. So you can see there's different kinds of presence. And the reason I, I want to share this with you is that um, somebody mentioned in the text, you know, what are we talking about a quality experience and so forth. And so before we start throwing technology at it um, and so forth, we need to think about what are the learning outcomes, obviously, go back to the 101. What do we want the students to get out of the, this with the learning outcomes, but also the learning experience? And so when I talk about using technology, uh, maybe using video, and I'll get to that momentarily, in service of what? You know, what do we want to do with that technology? What, what do we want to be happening on a day-to-day -day basis, synchronously, asynchronously, and so forth? So you can see here, um, and the, the link is there for that resource. So this is something we're promoting at San Diego State, uh, again, in this Course Design Institute, and then everything is wrapped around in service of this. So increasing your te the teaching presence, helping people uh, express their own personalities, and that making it more human um, and then engaging with uh, that cognitive presence, engaging with the, the content, engaging with each other, um, and so forth. So you can see that here. And you can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to actually put this other uh, link in the text chat here. Somebody asked about quality. So again, before um, we went to this fully online in the regular Course Design Institute, we were also promoting this um, quality online or the Colt rubric. And so I put that link in here. You can see what the CSU is doing around um, quality online and blended teaching and learning. Um, so these are just some um, frameworks that you can reference. So again, using technology um, and thinking about physical learning spaces, they all need to be designed in service of the learning experiences and the learning outcomes. And so you can see that quote here. And you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So as Miari was talking about, we too are using, um, and we have been for a while now, uh, live streaming capability, recording live lectures, and then recording content to be, you know, delivered asynchronously. So I teach blended classes. I have, I teach fully online with weekly live meetings. I also teach a fully asynchronous class. And so, um, again, we're, we're helping faculty think about how they can use uh, recorded lectures, um, recorded content, but I, I like to call it interactivating it. So how do you increase that engagement, that presence that we just talked about with um, using uh, video? And so, for instance, there are these in video quizzing types of tools, and Miati mentioned this, the annotating video. So there are a lot of creative ways you can think about um, chunking the, the recorded content, uh, maybe students, uh, you, you in, interject um, polling or knowledge checks or uh, reflection 
points within the video. You could even suggest that students have sort of a watch party where they watch the video together, but they're also discussing it in a synchronous way or an asynchronous way. You know, you could use a hashtag, um, Twitter hashtag or something like that. The annotation tool that Miati talked about where you can watch a recording and actually post your comments right there in line um, in, in, the, in the video and then other students can see that and engage with that in an asynchronous way, which is, which is uh, very useful. I use video a lot even in my completely synchronous, asynchronous classes, I should say, for weekly greetings. It really humanizes it, thinking of going back to teaching presence. So I will uh, send video greetings weekly. I will uh, use video to walk through the syllabus, to walk through major assignments in the course. I even use video to provide student feedback when I'm reading their work, and I'll give a quick uh, video feedback, and my students inevitably get uh, uh, tell me, thank you so much, that really made a difference to me, you know, having that human touch. Um, and this last thing here, you can see this uh, sort of heat map. Um, as Miati talked about, data-driven decision-making and KPIs, key performance indicators of what's working, what's not, where do you need improvement. This is a heat map, so the, the, the warm colors mean that students spent more time on that piece of content in the video rewinding, revisiting, reviewing, and so forth. So you can get data there on, okay, aha, at you know minute nine minutes and 37 seconds, students were bumping up against something. Uh, and so you can go back and look at the content there. Now that means that maybe you're teaching a, a asynchronous class, but you see that people are bumping up against that content, you can now adjust your instruction so that the next engagement you have with your students in a live meeting or in maybe a, a recording, um, you can maybe dive deeper into that specific content area. So really, it's, it's a great tool to uh, be responsive, you know, to the students' needs on a, on a weekly basis, on a semester basis, and so forth. And next slide. And this is just more detail. Um, I don't need to speak to this right now, for the, but you have this slide uh, deck and also just wanting to show you what we're doing in terms of the connected classrooms at San Diego State, what we're planning for the fall. And again, as Lisa mentioned, all of these resources, um, especially I can speak to the San Diego State resources, are up in in flex space. So please join that as Carl spoke to earlier. This is all about a community of practice for us to share our challenges, our tales from the trenches, uh, our solutions, best practices, and so forth. So we're openly publicly sharing this information in flex space. Arizona State has done that as well. Other campuses from the SUNY system, we're sharing what are we doing so that hopefully this can um, give you some guidance and you can definitely reach out to us for you know further conversation around it. So thank you all and I'll turn it back over to Carl. Rebecca, thank you so much. Uh, really great information, very dense amount of information here between all three of you. There's a great ideas, uh, there's, there's great projects that you're working on. And I think uh, it's, it's, it's inspiring. Uh, it's also, you know, can it be done? I think uh, the, the great thing is that you put yourself out there and you're open and willing all to have questions and answers with uh, the folks that have attended. And if, if they have questions about, hey, how can I do what you're doing, that uh, hopefully, you know, they'd be able to talk with you about that. So thank you for sharing all your ideas and being available uh, for, for everyone. Um, I think we're, uh, we just got the results uh, back from our first poll question. Wanted to just insert that real quick. Has the pandemic required use of technology permanently affected the expectations of students and the type of flexibility for schedules and engagement that they may expect in the future? And uh, the feedback was that 55% uh, mostly said, yes, it is going to impact, and 44% and, and said somewhat. Uh, so very few, what one person, uh, one school said not at all, but uh, it really, uh, this, this whole, uh, as I had said in the beginning in the intro, this COVID situation has really accelerated the use of technology and really changed the way that we're thinking. And I really appreciate our panelists today uh, being available to help us think through that sudden situation that we all find ourselves in. 
Um, I, you know, uh, so, some of these solutions are, you know, input ideas and assistance from our panelists, but also the consortium is there to provide assistance. Uh, there are grants out there that can help you provide these technology solutions. I'm highlighting a couple right here. Um, also, here are three that are very applicable to uh, the content that we've been talking about today, which revolves around teaching and learning. So if you need that assistance, not just the ideas, uh, but you're interested in some assistance, please uh, check out campusconsortium.org and uh, see if some of these can help you be prepared. Uh, I mean, fall's just around the corner, but spring will be here too, and who knows what, what that holds. So it's always good to have a conversation and connect with others about that. I'd like to thank uh, the great presenters and panelists today. Unfortunately, we don't really have enough time for questions and answers. We got a few, we answered them in the chat. What we'll do is we'll post uh, that information. And if there's questions that didn't get answered, we'll get them answered and, and, and back to you. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Andrea, Dr. Stevens, and Dr. Frazee for uh, attending today and really sharing what they've been going through. Uh, it's, it's much appreciated. I'd like to thank everyone that joined us today on this presentation. Uh, much appreciated that you're here. Hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, and if there's any follow-up questions, please feel free to contact me or Campus Consortium, and we'll definitely get you connected with the resource that you need. So thank you and uh, hope you uh, have a great rest of the day. Take care. Bye. Thanks everybody.